Welcome to week four of the Crossroads podcast. I can't believe we're already on week four. Uh, at the same time, it's taken us a lot more than four weeks to get here. So, yeah. Anyway, my name is Everett Wexel and joined, as always, by my brother and co-host, Alaric Wexel. That's me. How are you doing today, Alaric? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Um, so Awesome. Yeah. How about yourself? Less wildfires today? I yeah, hope. no wildfires today. Um, I mean, I think British Columbia still suffering but it sounds like it, it's not as in the news recently so i think uh you know we've had a little bit of rain recently i, I think the rest of the province has got a bit more rain than us as well so yeah here's hoping things awesome. are kind of wrapping up for the summer uh how about you how are things yeah, down in mexico you. uh pretty great i've just been working away uh nothing too out of the ordinary although i did take a trip last weekend which i'll be talking about in a bit here but first of all uh what's been going on with you this week um, or what's been on your mind? So what's been on my mind? I mean, yeah, I, not not a lot has really been going on uh, with me. It's been a fairly normal week. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading, and one of the books I've been reading is, I think I've actually mentioned it on this stream before, um, it's called No Boundary by... Hang on, I need to... No Boundary by Ken Wilber, and it's really good. I'm, I'm about halfway through. Um, That's the one you mentioned when we were talking about attention? No, or... this is actually a different one. Um, okay. So it's, yeah, it, it's a fairly short read, but it's got some good stuff in it. Uh, it seems like it's a, a sort of older book, so uh, yeah, about 2001. It's not even, not even super old, but almost 20 years old at, at this point, which is crazy just to think about that. Um, so it's kind of about Eastern and Western philosophies and kind of both their approaches to kind of personal growth. I, I guess it's, it's not exactly a self-help book. It's almost kind of like a, a personal philosophy book, I guess. Um, it's kind of hard to, you know, is it, <clears throat> it's got some philosophy. It'll get you thinking about things that, you know, hopefully the goal of it is to change the way you think about life um and you know for the better so where i want to talk about not about specifically the book today but just kind of about um recently just in our modern time you know even going back like 50 100 years ago kind of eastern philosophy and culture has kind of started to uh, the west has kind of started to integrate it into ways faster and faster um just even in this um this century you know this last from 2000 till here i've just personally seen the um the interest in the united states and canada you know pretty much north america and even in just the entire western world uh just the interest in eastern philosophies and religions like buddhism uh Taoism, um you know, even Hinduism or Jainism just kind of increase quite a bit. And sometimes that's just simply the interest in it. Sometimes that's the interest of kind of the ideas behind them and not so much their religion, like, you know, just yoga, uh, meditation. Um, that's been exploding, um, to say the least, Definitely, over yeah. here. Um, and so... As we talked about last week, we've both been playing the uh, the new World of Warcraft expansion, and there there is this quest in it. And this isn't a spoiler; it doesn't have anything to do with the storyline. Um, but it, it's a horde quest, and you have um, you know in Zoldazar the kind of the the zone on the Zandalar island um, that's kind of like the home base for the horde. They have um, a wildlife sanctuary. It's basically a dinosaur sanctuary because there are uh, brutosaurs and uh, I don't know other all, a bunch of different types of dinosaurs. Um, and so you have the uh, this goblin and a troll, and you know they're working at the the wildlife sanctuary, and they're having a, a problem where I guess like two of their brutosaurs, which are, are kind of like oh, what are the what are the dinosaurs with the big long, are just having 
trouble meeting or whatever. And yeah, the, I've heard people talking about this quest actually. Yeah. So the goblin and the troll have very different approaches to, you know, how they should fix the problem. The goblin all obviously wants to go full in on the technology. Uh, the troll wants to go full in on the voodoo. And you kind of go through the quest chain, you, you try each of their ideas and invariably, you know, both of their ideas just kind of fall flat. And then at the end of the quest chain, you kind of talk them to both of them and go, yeah, okay, so this, per you know, you talk to the goblin and say, the troll had some good ideas, but, had, you know, sh her idea had some shortcomings, which maybe your technology might be able to bolster up. And you go and say the same thing to the troll, like, hey, um, you, you know, your voodoo worked great, except for this one thing. Maybe the goblin's technology could, you know, just bolster it. Uh, and so at the end, you, uh, yeah, you combine the voodoo and the technology, um, and you come to a working solution that solves the, the issue, and the Brutosaurus live happily ever after. So it, it was just kind of interesting to kind of see that idea of sort of the, the, the combination of both sort of spirituality and science coming together to make something that is better than the sum of its parts. Um, and, you know, obviously it's not a new idea, but, um, and, you know, it just World of Warcraft in general, it's, you know, it's a game where there's kind of, there, there's sci-fi type stuff, that, you know, there's a bunch of technology, and there's also fantasy, it's, it's this weird amalgamation of stuff, so it's not super out of place or anything, but kind of the way they directly tackle that idea of, you know, the synthesis of the, these two pretty much opposite ways of thinking. Um, and I think that's just right. something, you know, we're kind of starting to see more and more. We're sort of starting to see... Um, you know, more often, we kind of went through a phase, I feel, in the 80s, 90s, and like early 2000s, where, um, you know, atheism was kind of, you know, it was the new hot thing, and everybody, at least around my age, obviously, I was kind of, you know, a kid and a teenager throughout that time, but everybody my age was really into atheism, like, hardcore into it, like, you do or die. Militant atheism. Yeah, you know, even agnostics were seen as just weird, you know, people would debate, um, you know, they'd be super into debating and trying to tell the other side that they're wrong. Um, right. And more recently, I feel Because that's like, productive. Yeah, I feel like there's been much more of sort of resurgence of people either going agnostic or kind of looking more towards, um, I guess instead of religion, more, sort of more philosophy, but just more spirituality in general. Um, you know, and again, this is mostly looking at it from my age range. Like I'm, I'm 25 right now. Um, you know, most of the people I know are between 20 and 30, but that seems to be a really big thing. There's just kind of seems to have been a resurgence of spirituality, but it hasn't gone all the other way, you know, all the way in the opposite direction. Um, you know, it's kind of, we're sort of, it seemed to be coming to this middle ground where both science and spirituality are pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so that's interesting. Um, kind of, you know, I don't... I don't really have a thesis for this um, segment, but there, you know, just reading this book that I'm reading, there was one thing that kind of, you know, he had brought up, which is just kind of interesting, that a lot of the Eastern thought, um, you know, because I'm a Buddhist, I, I like, I truly believe that, you know, we, there is no self. And what I mean by that is, yeah, there, you could, draw a boundary around the things that we are and say this is a you know yourself um but it doesn't really i mean people have different levels of what they describe as themselves like some people say you know it yourself is your entire body and all your thoughts and everything um some people go as far to, as to say you know, the subconscious parts of your body, you know, the thing that takes care of your heartbeat, um, you know, your sort of peripheral nervous system, those things aren't really yourself because, it, you know, it isn't being controlled. And some people go even further to say, like, you know, only their conscious um, 
you know, only their conscious mind, nothing in the subconscious is their self. And some people have the, are on this level where, you know, they realize the whole universe is the self. Um, I don't explain this anywhere near as eloquently as Ken Wilber does, but, you know, it's just so subjective what the self actually is, and people are changing, um, you know, all the cells in our body are just turning over, new atoms are kind of, you know, flowing in and out of us, um, you know, very, very quickly to the point where even, you know, people say the whole thing of like every seven years, all the cells in your body turn over. And that, that might be kind of true on average. Like, you know, it's a very, right. it's a very wishy-washy number. But the, the sentiment behind that notion kind of is, you know, it does hold. Um, and then you just think about, you know, people who might be going through brain trauma or whatever, like, mm -hmm how many uh, neurons do you have to take out of the picture before there's the, you know, at what line it does taking one neuron out of your brain and, or turning off, like, when does it suddenly, it, like, it doesn't seem like a binary thing. Like, you have a self and then flip, like, immediately a uh, switch is flipped yeah. and you don't have a self. I'm glad you mentioned this because I actually had the other week, like, a similar conversation just with my girlfriend, Vanessa. We just talk about weird stuff mm -hmm. uh, because that's how we are. But, like, you know, I, I've talked about before, I'm not like, I don't have any strong spiritual beliefs, but that's not because I don't care about spirituality. It's more like, I don't even know how you would confirm or deny a spiritual belief. So I'm kind of open to all of them, but not yeah. really set on all of them. So one thing is like, uh, souls, like I'm willing to believe that we could have souls. Um, but then you get into like the logistics of how souls actually work. Like people would think like, you know, most people who believe in souls, it's some kind of thing that usually is different than your body and lives on after your death or in some other form, right? Yeah. So, but then you sort of assume like your soul has some sort of personality. So it's like what you were talking about, like, uh, does your soul, like, is your personality like a representative of your soul somehow? Like what the person you really are and then that gets represented in your brain chemistry because like we we can uh literally look in a person's brain and be like oh there's anger we we found like the their anger chemical in their brain so like is the anger coming from your soul or is like you know are the chemicals in your brain a reflection of what is in your soul mm -hmm. uh but then uh the brain trauma thing exactly what you were saying like you know uh there's that case we all learn in like psychology 101 classes his name was like something gauge like the railway worker who gets a railway spike through his brain and then miraculously survives and makes a full recovery except then his personality is just forever different and he's like a completely different person for the rest of his life mm -hmm. uh does that like did his soul change like if he died and then and lived on as a soul like which personality would his soul have yeah uh, well it's you know one of the reasons that buddhism you know or even not even necessarily buddhism but that kind of the the uh, sort of, I mean, the book is called No Boundary simply because uh, what's um, no boundary awareness is what he calls it, where once you kind of reach that no boundary awareness, where you know, the th you stop kind of drawing a boundary around yourself and saying, This is a specific thing, this is me, and just say, Yeah, everything. You know, it's not even saying everything is me because, you know, that's still putting a boundary around mm -hmm. something. But just saying, you know, experiences exist and I am experiencing or not even I am experiencing, but just, you know, an amalgamation of experiences is creating the perception of me being me. But when you kind of get to that point where you do sort of identify with the whole universe, you kind of transcend the need for a soul because kind of everything is the soul i guess if that makes sense um and yeah so kind of what he had pointed out is, which was really interesting to me is a lot of eastern religions like kind of going back thousands and thousands of years they sort of started with this idea of no self um they um you know, they never kind of got away from that. In the, you know, in the West, we did. We got very, um, you know, we started using boundaries. Everything is boundary lay. You know, just even using word. Anytime you label something with a name, I guess, you know, that's, 
where he's kind of starting off with this is, you know, as soon as we start naming things and labeling things and saying this, you know, specific thing is this, you know, that draws a boundary because it has to, you know, what that thing is has to end somewhere for that to be useful. And, you know, boundaries are useful. Um, there's kind of, you know, I use that phrase like, you know, don't mistake the map for the terrain mm -hmm. phrase before because, you know, I think it holds, but that doesn't mean maps aren't useful. Um, for sure. Yeah, it's a... Uh... I mean, going back kind of to the root of Western philosophy, I, was it Plato or Aristotle or one of the, you know, the big Greek philosophers basically figured out that like things can, like when you get right down to it, things can only be defined by what they're not. Mm -hmm. uh, like you can't really understand cold and that it's like, it's not warm or like a table is made up of like legs and planks laid across it. But like the whole object is a table because the table is what is not the floor or the other things around it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, but it's just kind of interesting to sort of think about. And I, I think that's where kind of the synthesis of these two ways of thought can kind of be really helpful and interesting because yeah putting labels on things and then sort of you have like meta labels as, as soon as you kind of start going from just like names of things and groups of things like, like algebra gets really interesting because you are you know you are using variables in place of labels like a variable can be any number of labels and so you have meta labels in that sense and as you kind of get further in mathematics you kind of you know you start going on top of that by the time you get to you know quantum mechanics everything just gets really weird and the thing that it really starts to be interesting is once you start kind of get to quantum mechanics and start going beyond that you start sort of approaching this place where we realize what we're going to is things like unified theories where we're kind of trying to get away from labels again so we've kind of we're starting to go full circle when you know at the point we're getting to in mathematics um you know it, it is when you just like quantum field theory is really interesting because it kind of you know there's nothing really discrete in quantum mechanics like mm -hmm. you know everything is basically linked to everything and it's just fluctuations in those fields you know not there's no delimiters um, that say, you know, this is where one thing starts and this is where another thing ends. It's just, you know, just fluctuations, waves in those fields that kind of make up everything. Um, and people, you know, it's really hard to make a, a unified theory or grand unified theory, but that, you know, it seems like it will be possible to just kind of have one thing that sort of just defines everything in the universe, basically. And, you know, obviously it won't define everything because just whatever the initial seed of our universe is that made all the variations will still kind of be there and underlying but um yeah so but bring this back to stuff that's a little bit more useful in daily life um i you know i think one of the things that really does kind of call i mean at least for me one of the things that's been most helpful about meditation and just mindfulness in general is kind of coming to the realization that, yeah, I, I am not separate from, you know, everything. Like, I am directly connected to everything by being part of the universe. By being part of the universe, I am literally part of everything. Um, I mean, it, it makes you just kind of immediately, it makes you a little, a little less scared of death. It also kind of brings, you know, the idea of karma is kind of, it becomes something that isn't punishing because as we know, like people respond way worse to punishment than they do to kind of reward. And I guess, you know, mm -hmm. karma does kind of have that system where the way the connotation it has, the way people generally think about it, I guess, you know, people think about it, oh, if you do a good deed, you get reward. But more often, like, you know, when you say somebody's getting their karma, the connotation is... You know they've done something bad um and are getting their just desserts but when you kind of come to the realization that yeah because i am part of everything doing a good deed for somebody else literally is you know i'm making the universe better therefore i'm making the thing that i'm not only living in better but i am actually a you know i'm just a part of the universe experience like i'm directly making myself better um mm. But, you know, oh, sorry, go ahead. 
just that, uh, and sorry if this completely derails it, but it probably says a lot about me as a person and different types of people that, like, I guess I would almost see that from, like, a Lovecraftian sense of, like, who defines what is making the universe better or worse. Like, once you get to the universe scale, like, human concepts of good and evil and or good and bad are just go right out the window, right? Like, mm-hmm. Like saying, like, oh, like, <clears throat> giving Excuse money me. to a homeless person, like, that's not, the universe doesn't care. I think that's good, right? So then if you, when you get into that view of karma, if you are the universe doing what's good for the universe, like, what does that even mean? Well, okay. I mean, you kind of, this you start to diverge in the individual philosophy. And, and I mean, you know, this is, once you kind of start to think about it in those terms, like, yeah, whatever, I mean, really, whatever you think, goes i mean you know you are you you are the universe decide what is you decide what is good i guess Mm -hmm. um you know you know as as well as anybody else because you are literally the thing that you're trying to make better um but i mean that's kind of a place where you know a lot of eastern religions literally their only goal is just to reduce suffering you know Mm -hmm. or eliminate it completely Uh, buddhism kind of tackles this by saying, you know, our ultimate goal is simply to just put it all aside or at least not react to anything that happens and not necessarily not react, but not like, you know, not, I guess not even not react. Don't become attached to it um, because as we know, the only constant is change. Um, Anything that we become attached to is going to go away. That doesn't mean we can't enjoy it while it lasts. Although, you know, if you're, depending on the tradition of Buddhism, if you're trying to you know, attain nirvana where you completely, you know, you just end the cycle of rebirth and are literally just leaving, um, you know, just samsara in general, then, you know, maybe that gets a little bit more extreme. Uh, it's also one of the things I'm kind of trying to tackle with my personal philosophy that I'm sort of building up, which is sort of a bit of an alternative to Buddhism, where I think, you know, it works a little bit better for somebody who just wants to live by, you know, in the universe as it is now and not necessarily just you know step away from it um <clears throat> but yeah i mean we know i don't know I, th- I feel like we have a pretty good idea of what causes human suffering and just the the idea behind thinking about these things is simply to try to reduce suffering because that you know that's the only compass mm-hmm. we really have to go for by. sure yeah like i was most i guess i was mostly just being pedantic and like if you extrapolate any philosophy far enough it just kind of all leads to nihilism but yeah. if you if you just say if you replace universe at least the way i perceive it if you just say like i am connected to all of humanity and what is good for humanity is good for me then that, mm-hmm. on a practical level that totally works so. yeah it definitely i mean i think everybody kind of has to and this is you know it's a reason why i think everybody should be looking at both western and eastern um, philosophies and ways of learning and all these different things because they both have really good ideas and i think they both actually benefit a lot from each other as well like you know there are the way humans have evolved unless we are planning to go the buddhist route and you know try to step away from samsara um you know, samsara, the way we've evolved to live in samsara, there are some rules that kind of go along with it and kind of putting labels on things and drawing maps, you know, proverbial maps kind of help, and I guess not so proverbial maps, uh, just helps us kind of navigate um, that. And, you know, that doesn't mean we can't go the more extreme route later <laughs> on, maybe once we've... Uh, well, and I guess the other part of it too is even in, in Buddhism... Um, I mean, yeah, I guess there are like bodhisattvas, which are, you know, people who basically have reached enlightenment or nirvana, but are continuing to stay, you know, in the world to help others progress on the path. And if you're going to be somebody who does that, um, you know, obviously you still got to kind of work within the constraints or at least be able to communicate to people within the constraints that they kind of have. Um, So, yeah, I... A lot of the time, you know, I am somebody who, in my philosophy, I lean very Eastern, kind of. Um, right. As I said, I, I'm Buddhist, but I definitely think there is, you know, a lot to kind of learn from the Western schools of thought as well. 
for um, sure. So yeah. And I've mentioned this before, like most recently when we were talking about Hemingway, uh, like it's actually surprising how much overlap there is and how like they arrive to the same conclusions from completely <clears throat> different starting points. Like I've mentioned that Stoicism and Buddhism like kind of boil down to the same philosophy, but yeah, totally different reasoning. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's all. I've pretty much just, you know, just been thinking about that and don't have too much more to say on it, but, um, yeah, no, yeah. that's all really interesting though. Uh, definitely suggest giving the book no boundary by Ken Wilber a read. Uh, it's this one. And yeah, so awesome. With that all yeah, said, I have, I, I guess I'm kind of holding myself back cause I have a whole other tangent I could go on, but like a, you know, it could turn into a whole conversation by itself. So, hmm. uh, I guess the, I guess just so I've been reading Principles by Ray Dalio. It's a really good book. And it's like, you know, he's a stock market investor, but like all his principles for stock market investing, they come out of like him basically observing the natural world and saying like, whatever works for ma nature should work for me. And then like applying the principles of like evolution and biology to the stock market and it's worked for him. So hmm. I've been thinking about that and like, I don't know, something I think a lot uh, about a lot since I'm interested in fantasy and games like Warcraft and novels and stuff is the way that nature is always portrayed as a view. Like, you know, druids in World of Warcraft, for example, they use nature magic and they're all in tune with nature. But how, I guess, at least in Western society, the way we interpret nature and what it signifies is like so completely different than, I guess, just the plain scientific interpretation of nature. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, if there was a nature worshiping religion kind of like the Druids in Warcraft, I feel like it would basically be like the complete inverse of Buddhism, the way you were describing it. Because, uh, you know, the goal of Buddhism is to let go of your attachments and stop reacting to pain and stuff. Whereas, like, the main defining thing of nature is, like, evolution. Like, nature is basically all about and completely defined by evolution. And evolution is literally organisms reacting to suffering and yeah. killing each other until only the strongest one survives and then propagating and then changing and, like... Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting in that there, you know, in Buddhism, there, you know, at least the forms of Buddhism that I've kind of thought of, like, you know, with the whole rebirth cycle, um, you know, I, it's kind of hard to really grasp. Um, it, like, it's one of the more esoteric parts of Buddhism, and it's not really as simple as, you know, you get reborn as a rabbit if you do bad things or whatever but there is kind of a hierarchy like, like um confucianism where i don't know if you know this and i don't think this applies to all sects of confucianism but i know there was one point where it was a confucius belief that if you're evil then you are reborn as a woman and obviously you know, very problematic um yeah so i i don't really know about that but no i mean there is a, a hierarchy where you know and obviously buddhism you're not supposed to harm anything really so you know you are if you're following it to you know all the precepts like vegetarian or veganism is on there um you know you're not supposed to be doing harm to any animal so the idea is kind of yeah that process has happened but humans are on a you know they're the highest tier of living things and you know that's one of the things that kind of separates them is you know they have that virtue of being able to kind of transcend the more savage um, aspects of nature. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and, and you know, you can be reborn Which, as mean, an I, animal, I, I... and you know, the more sentient, you know, there is a hierarchy of animals that are seen as better, or, you know, at least just further along in that progression. Um, so yeah, right. I mean, very, very no, possibly. Like I can totally agree with that as a philosophy but i'm just saying if you took like nature at face value like putting a human label and saying like oh the savage part of nature is bad and we need to transcend that like that's basically spitting in the face of nature as a forest and saying mm -hmm. like yeah yeah anyway that's a whole other yeah. tangent i yeah there's i'll just say there's a reason why uh in christianity and other western religions like all like say in and all the evil things in the religion are based on like nature worshiping religions from before like Satan is basically pan because our western whether we realize it consciously or not our western philosophy is kind of based around the idea that nature is the ultimate evil so i always find that interesting 
All right. Well, with that anyway. all said, uh, yeah, what have you been thinking about this week? Well, the the main thing is, like I said, I took a trip uh, the previous weekend. Um, yeah, so my girlfriend's parents are kind of having a, I guess it's somewhere between what you would think of as like an anniversary and a anniversary celebration and a wedding renewal. It's like, I know in the States and Canada, people will sometimes do wedding renewals, but it's almost like, I feel like the connotation is usually that is when a marriage is going bad, they have a ceremony to kind of get it back on track. And I mean, if that works for you, great. But from I, my limited knowledge, I'm pretty sure that's the kind of thing that never really works. Like big flashy ceremonies aren't the way to fix relationships. Mm -hmm. But in any case, uh, in Mexico, it's not like that. I don't actually know how many years it is, but in Mexico, it's just a normal thing. But after so many years of marriage, you have basically an anniversary celebration, but it's celebrated literally by having a wedding again, like doing the vows and, uh, you know, the reception and the ceremony and all those things are the same. The main difference is that, like, I think the bride doesn't wear white because you wear white before you're married and then it represents, like, your purity of not marriedness. I don't know. But, yeah. So it's basically a wedding again. Um, and it's just as exciting and stressful as like preparing preparing for any wedding so there's been a lot of them being stressed out but then also a lot of cool and exciting stuff and i've i've never actually been to a wedding uh i don't know if you have uh i mean other than our parents wedding uh did you i I didn't go to our parents' wedding. Yeah, well, I mean, they had they had a wedding and then kind of came down and did another wedding for, you know, just the friends that were more local. So I guess it was technically, yeah. And oh, oh no, I we act, I actually happened to, when I was young, our parent and I think you actually did go to this. You were just too young to remember. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, our, our parents brought us all along to just a friend of theirs' weddings. Um, I mean, yeah, I was like seven or six or something. Oh, no. Yeah, okay. I think I maybe remember that one. I don't know. But yeah, our biological parents, people might be wondering, like, don't most people are not there for their parents' wedding? But yeah, our biological parents were never married. And then when our mom married our stepfather, we were around at that point. But uh, it was like in Canada and we live in California and I was like two or something. No, I was four? Three, three? four, uh it just or no a little older than, i think you might have been five but our younger brother sounds... was like three or two or something so yeah yeah exactly so it could sound really bad that like oh our parents didn't invite us to their wedding but also we were like toddlers and they, yeah. it was international and, and yeah they came so they back like... and actually did an actual you know another wedding yeah. for yeah so in any case my point with all i've never been to a wedding when i was old enough to actually remember and uh I've definitely never been involved in like the preparation process for a wedding. I actually almost did go to a wedding this previous year, but it was in Cuba. And since I'm still an American citizen, I can't actually go to Cuba. Mm. Uh, so reasons why, you know, it, when I do get my Mexican citizenship, I'm going to have to revoke either my Canadian or American. And I think I'm leaning toward revoking my American one just so I can travel more places because Canada yeah. isn't really enemies of anyone. But in any case, uh, yeah, so we've been like small little pueblos uh, just in the state just south of Mexico City. So it's a state called Morelos. And it's like Mexico City, it's really high altitude. It's like most of the state, I think, would be between 8,000 to 10,000 feet up. Huh. Um, so it's not the stereotypical vision of Mexico most people would have. Like there are, there is desert there. But it's also, it's mostly forested. And there's, there's these big, like, rolling forest valleys and green hills and all of that stuff. Um, so it is really pretty. And then we're just going down to these tiny towns. Uh, so the majority of the places, oh, yeah, so the purpose of the trip was just to check out places where they might get married. Um, you know, usually in the States, uh, you get married at a church and then... 
I guess I don't even know, like, the ceremony usually happens at a church, but then the reception is usually just, is it just like a hotel or something? Like a hotel ballroom? Or? Uh, I think it could be anywhere, really. I mean, yeah. some people have their reception outside, some will have it just at yeah, a house, sure. some will have it, like, I don't know, I think some might even do it at a church, the same church. I, I, yeah, I know. I just haven't been to enough weddings to really. Oh, I know. I mean, I just always, I always see in movies. It's just like generally, there's just a fancy place, and yeah, I was seeing it's just like I don't know a hotel ballroom or some fancy place. But anyway, uh, that does happen here in Mexico City too. Like there are definitely those places, but uh, it seems like most people get married in ex haciendas, which uh, I think most people know what an hacienda is. It's just like back during the colonial period of Mexico, there would be kind of, it's halfway between a house and a town. It's like if a whole very small town was kind of like one building almost. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, it's filled with courtyards and there's like different parts of it where different people can sleep. And you can even, there would be like animal pens inside of the building and all that. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, but like they are lar like, it's almost like a compound, like the whole, like all the buildings are kind of connected by walls, you know, sort of like a castle even, you know how medieval castles would have villages inside them. Yeah. Uh, not that big or grand, but yeah, it's all like kind of one structure. Um, in any case, so there are these ex haciendas all over Mexico because the hacienda system isn't really a thing anymore. With modern technology, farmers are just like the states. They just have giant fields with like, you know, because we have more efficient ways to farm now. Uh, in any case, they're super pretty and they're a really popular place to get married. And there's kind of, they'll usually have chapels as part of the building, but then also like big patios and fields and stuff where you can have the reception. And yeah, so they're super pretty. Um, the first three we saw were in a town called Cuernavaca, which uh, just like an hour or two south of Mexico City, it's known as like the town of eternal spring because it's basically always spring weather there just something about its location and altitude and everything yeah um yeah and then we had uh we also tasted at one of the haciendas we uh tasted like the caterers that are possibly going to be catering the wedding and i don't know if you've ever had like what fancy wedding food but not uh, specifically or wedding food, to like, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I've had fancy, super fancy food. Like, basically where the point, you know, like, the presentation is almost more important than the food, so it's, like, just yeah. ridiculous dishes that's, like, I don't know, like, we cut these red peppers into tiny strings and then deep-fried them so they become, like, sticks. So you have this, like, fried, hardened stick of red pepper, and, like, you put that in a, like, mountain of avocado paste, or, I don't know. So just really fun things like that. So that mm -hmm. was awesome. Um, it was really delicious. And the presentation was, like I said, really outlandish and cool. Um, and then it is Mexico. So it's all the like Mexico food, like guacamole and uh, taquitos and stuff like that. Uh, cool. Yeah. And then we went to Tepoztlan, which is another even smaller town. Uh, and I've been there once before, but it's actually one of my favorite places in Mexico. It's like this tiny town in the valley and then there's these mountains overlooking the town and there's the Tepozteco on top of the mountains which is a pyramid like a very small pyramid it's like uh i don't know maybe like 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide uh so the pyramid itself is pretty small and it has a little altar on top of it but then it's on top of the mountain so that kind of makes up for it uh so great views from it obviously and then it's really impressive when like there's a stairway the whole way up to it which is like a thousand years old so it's really impressive to think of like how the people actually just hauled all these stones up this mountain and then like it's a several kilometer hike and yeah hauled all these stones up this mountain yeah. and built a pyramid up there and built the whole staircase getting there uh it's yeah the site is like sacred to the god of agave which is the plant you make Oh, was it tequila or mezcal? They actually made out different plants. Um, I think agave is tequila. Or no, maybe they're both. I thought they were both. Um, yeah, yeah. Made, I think um, yeah. Agave, yeah. Yeah. I, I think, think like, okay, isn't one made things. of, like, the, the flowers and one's made of the plant part or something? Like, I, I don't know. I feel like they're made of different parts of the plant. Or one's made sure. from the fruit or something. I don't, I don't know. 
Yeah, no, I just know there's there's agave, and then there's another very similar plant that I always get it confused with, but it's a different alcohol that's made out of that one. But in any case, yeah, you make alcohol out of it. It's just, it's like the site is sacred to the god of agave. It's supposedly where like he gifted it to mortals, and it's one of those things where like even if that didn't happen, like there is a bunch of agave growing there, so it is possible that that is the site where people actually like first discovered agave and then propagated it. Do you have to interject um, something? So agave nectar is a fad right now um, for some reason. Like people think it's more, more, it's better for you than like corn syrup or sugar or whatever. It's not. Agave is like literally, I mean, I guess it might be a tad bit better than just like pure straight up corn syrup because, you know, it'll have more nutrients in it. However, it's literally just loaded with fructose, glucose, um, sugar. It's just pure sugar straight in your mouth doesn't have any of the good stuff like the you know fiber or whatever it, you know, like super refined yeah, that's so, funny it's um like it's you know that's the thing here obviously he'll get like ice cream or soda with agave nectar and i, I always assumed like it tastes like pure sugar i always assumed it was yeah. just sugar no but... it, it is literally just straight up sugar um it, you know if yeah. you it's n probably like the composition of it is like 99 percent similar to actual just corn syrup um you know honey yeah. honey is like still just straight up sugar has a little bit more, more nutrients so if you're looking for an alternative that might be a tad bit healthier for you honey however it's all just pure sugar um yeah just thought i throw that out there just because no totally I it's have to Never hear funny, agave, cause... I just like shake my head because people are just eating weight. I mean, not and not a lot of people are eating. It's not like this huge thing. It's overtaken everybody. But you know, when I go over to somebody's house and they're all, you know, you know those people who are just like health nuts. You know, they call themselves health nuts. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I just laugh when I go over to their house and there is a Same bottle of agave. And... Drink coconut water all the time. Yeah, I mean, okay, I will oh. actually step up and defend coconut water a little bit. Really. Um, I thought coconut so, water was also just pure sugar. No, like I know so coconut, was, coconut milk is amazing, but coconut water is... No, so coconut water, I mean, it does have a fair amount of sugar, but le like... Mm -hmm. All I know is you can't have it on the keto diet, whereas coconut milk is like your yeah, staple no. on the keto it's, diet. Um, it's got a bunch of carbohydrates. So uh, coconut um, water is actually, if you're the kind of person who drinks Gatorade or Powerade, uh, coconut water is actually a much, much better substitute. Um, Gatorade and Powerade are actually another thing that I've had some issue with recently because they they advertise the electrolytes like you know that's their whole I'm thing. Basically drinking that. It's not actually Gatorade or Powerade, but this is basically an yeah. electrolyte thing. So and things like that. Um, to be you fair, know, like no part of me actually thinks this is healthy overall, and its effectiveness might even just be placebo. But basically, yeah. it's sometimes the climate like the climate here is so different than Vancouver, and like sometimes it just gets so dry here that I feel like it almost flu feels like a flu is coming on when it gets yeah. so dry and I get so dehydrated, and I take one of these and I feel better. So even if it is placebo, I prefer not to know that and just well. Like, and it's hard it. to know actual Gatorade and Powerade. Like Powerade's a little bit better than Gatorade, but neither of them are great. Like they advertise the electrolytes. So electrolytes are, um, you know, they are elements that can easily contain like a positive charge because they lose a couple of their electrons. So um, sodium, magnesium, potassium, and calcium are your, you know, the primary electrolytes that we have in our body. Um, and if you actually like look at, um, so, you know, sodium, obviously we, most people have enough sodium kind of in their diet. If you're exercising heavily, you know, maybe you might need a little bit more, but the problem it with an electrolyte sports drink that is, you know, sold in stores and people are buying is if it actually has enough electrolytes to give you anything at all, it's going to taste awful. So just kind of an idea of how little electrolyte something like, uh, let's just say Gatorade, um, so for potassium, the average adult male needs 3,200, 3, so 3,200 milligrams of potassium per day. Um, Gatorade contains uh, somewhere around 100 milligrams. Um, so literally one, um, you know, only a 32nd of the potassium that is your daily recommended value for you know just people who kind of have a normal diet and exercise for somebody who actually exercises regularly it's going to be even less so you know you'd actually have to drink 32 bottles of gatorade to get your baseline amount of potassium per day and besides that it has 
a negligible amount of calcium and literally no magnesium um, and just a little bit of sodium. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of boggles my mind. And it's just like the same thing. It's just if you actually looked at how much um, sugar would be in it, I think you'd put it'd be something like three or four tablespoons of sugar, which comes out to something like near a quarter cup of sugar in a bottle of Gatorade. Um, and just the calories that you're putting into you, you literally have to be running for around an hour just to burn off that one bottle of Gatorade. So yeah, I mean, the, the zero version's a little bit better, um, uh, but if you're actually looking for electrolyte, um, you know, something to replenish your electrolytes, just, uh, getting a cup of water, putting a little bit of salt in it, which I you know some people don't like that. Um, there's, there's this salt substitute called no salt, or is it, you know, it can be called any number of things, but it'll, it'll normally be in the same aisle that salt has. It'll just be, uh, you know, a salt replacement for people who can't have a lot of sodium in their diets. Um, and it'll, you know, as it's only ingredient, it'll have potassium chloride. Um, and if you just put some of, you know, some salt and some potassium chloride in some water and just drink it, like, you know, it works perfectly fine for, you know, just giving you some electrolytes and it costs a couple mm -hmm. cents, whereas Gatorade costs like, you know, $2 for a bottle of it. Um, Something I found, like, uh, when I do have a flu and I'm not even sure, like, since I've discovered after I moved here, so it's possible I don't even know if, like, it's a flu virus or sometimes I do just get really dehydrated because of the different climate here but mm -hmm. the most effective thing i've found like more effective than any flu medication is i literally just uh like you said put some salt in some water and then squeeze a bunch of like fresh lime juice into yeah. it oh, and yeah. that I, makes that... me feel like a thousand times better uh, yeah. any case that was a huge yeah. tangent um... no it's, it's totally cool uh uh yeah I mean, it was something actually educational and valuable out of my basically just, hey, I yeah. traveled this weekend and it was fun. But no, it is, it is always funny how like, you know, people, health nuts as you describe or actually self-describe, they always are really into like exotic things. Yeah. Like, you know, agave syrup, it's just a thing here. Like people eat it, but no one really thinks it's a superfood. They're just mm -hmm. like, yeah, we get this sugary syrup out of this plant <laughs> that we also make mezcal and tequila out of and it tastes good. So we put it in soda, yeah. which no one really thinks is healthy uh but then the states they're like oh it's this mysterious plant from mexico that yeah. was passed down from the ancients and the nectar will make you live forever yeah oh i actually remembered so i was going to finish my thought um coconut water actually is one of the it actually has a really balanced source of electrolytes and a, a good portion of them and it has significantly like a third of the sugar like milliliter per milliliter or milliliter mm. to milliliter that something like Gatorade or Powerade does. So it actually works really well as a sports drink because, you know, huh. a, a little bit of sugar when you're exercising isn't a bad thing. It, you know, if you're doing something where you need energy, um, if you're just working out to lose some pounds, then, you know, probably stay away from the coconut water. But, um, yeah, coconut water, um, I kind of like the taste of it. It's something that I can't drink a ton of or, I, you know, it's just kind of cloying almost, but right. it's actually not as bad as some people would have you believe. And actually really yeah. good for a specific purpose of rehydrating you, um, especially if you, you know, just need some electrolytes now. For sure, yeah. I mean, I, so I do naturally have low blood pressure and not, weight has never really been a problem for me. So when I am exercising really hard, it's not, I don't really care about the like, calories or yeah. sugar at all. It's just like, how can I not pass out? Because mm -hmm. that's how I found out I have low blood pressure as I was doing four hours of kickboxing. And then I, my vision went black and the doctor was like, Hey, this is the up, like, I normally don't give this advice, but you need to like eat a <laughs> bunch of potato chips and drink a bunch of Gatorade because you have yeah. no electrolytes in your body right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was basically just all the sodium, that you can consume cool anyway uh sorry oh no i was just gonna say back to our regularly yeah. scheduled I'll just tie segment. up my travelogue so yeah uh the tepas deco the little pyramid on top of the mountain it's uh like i said sacred to the god of agave who i actually can't remember his name right now sadly mm. um but anyway, it's an interesting thing where it's, uh, you know, that's part of the mythology is that that's where he gifted man 
the agave and the knowledge of distilling alcohol, which, you know, I have no actual evidence on this, but I like to extrapolate that maybe that really is where people first discovered agave and how to distill it. And then that got like woven into the cultural legend. Yeah. Um, in any case, it's also supposedly the birthplace of a much more recognizable god to most people, which uh, would be Quetzalcoatl mm. or Kokolkan in the Maya religion, but they're the same figure generally. Um, yeah, I'm sure most of you have heard of Quetzalcoatl, the big feathered snake that's supposed to eat the world at the end and then rebirth it. Uh, yeah, he was supposedly born there. So it is really cool. Like, it is really cool to go to a little town like the Paslen and then go to a place like that, even if you don't, like, I don't really believe in Quetzalcoatl or any of the Nahuatl or Maya gods, but it's like when you're in a, I, just something, and maybe it's just, it depends on what type of person you are, but when you're in a place like that, like on top of this lonely mountain with mist all around you, like you almost feel or you like want to believe in stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it's always interesting think of how the people back then must have felt kind of going into this place that has that feeling like you know maybe there's just a reason they chose those sites and exactly. you know who even knows i mean you know especially with all the shamanic stuff they may have been doing like the either trances they may have been inducing either with you know the mushrooms they were probably eating plants. well that's what i was going to say like you know power plants were a big part of kind of their commuting yeah. with the spirit world and i don't i, I mean not Silas Ivan definitely doesn't grow into Pus land, but they could have had like ayahuasca or something. No, I, I'm, yeah, I mean, there's lots of different things. I, I guess, how close to Oaxaca is it? Uh, Very. Not like, I guess, I guess a third of Mexico away. So uh, to Pus okay. land, like I was saying, Morelos is just south. Like it's the state that borders Mexico City on the south. Mexico City is basically like as central, like it's right in the center of Mexico. Yeah. Um, more or less, because there's kind of that part that goes off to the side. But yeah, when you see Mexico on a map, there's like the going down part, and that sort of veers off to the right. Mm -hmm. uh, the part that veers off to the right, that's where Oaxaca is. And then there's the Yucatan Peninsula. So right, okay. that uh, lower right part is all the, like where the Maya were and where the Silas Ivan grows and the mushroom cults are still around in any case like you know however they might have gotten to their trances you know not to say they were communing with spirits or anything but you know if they thought they were you know they're definitely places like that the the ambience and atmosphere and just kind of the, mm -hmm. you know the subconscious feel of the, the place would have definitely been brought out a lot more and you know it's kind of hard to say i think sometimes that places that kind of have sort of you know, we have all these patterns in the universe and a lot of, you know, when we feel things, we all subconsciously, we're creating a map of everything around ourselves all the time. And we're kind of extrapolating different things out of, you know, just when we kind of feel uh, like, hey, have you ever had that experience where you kind of remember your dream, but you kind of remember how it felt? You can't remember mm -hmm. like, the specifics of it. You just kind of have that you know, you feel right. the feeling that you felt when you were actually experiencing that dream. Uh, kind of those experiential feelings, I think, can sometimes be sort of telling us things. And that's when about... I know I don't want to remember my dream. Hmm. Yeah. No, I'm kidding. Like, Not most of the. I mean, there are some times where you just are kind of like groggy in the morning. You're like, oh, I should go make some breakfast. And you kind of think, oh, what was, it, what was I dreaming about? And you just get this feeling of like terror. And you're like, oh, oh I don't think yeah. I want to revisit that. <laughs> Anyway, you know, they're just that sort of feeling where we take um, all the information we've gathered about a place um, and how it all relates to each other and kind of synthesize this feeling about it. Um, you know, I, I have this, and maybe I could be completely off, but whenever we feel kind of that some place has a significance or a sort of, you know, for me, it's always an epicness. Like, it feels like something, you know, just the different aspects of the environment and how things have happened throughout time at that place have kind of come together to just make this place that is significant um, in some way. You know, maybe that's just what they were feeling when they felt that place. Like maybe, mm -hmm. and it might even just be kind of a, a, a sort of thing that's useful. Like obviously these people living out in nature um, for the bulk of their lives would come to kind of be able to 
look at their environment, look at you know where they were, and just go, yeah, this is a place. I can just kind of feel that this place will probably have an abundance of food, or maybe this place has a lack of predators. Um, you know, and there could even now today, like that's such a, a thing that I think a large part of that's probably practice and having lived out there and mm -hmm. having kind of um, the knowledge, you know, of everybody that you oh, live with. For sure. With. I mean, it's, but, it's basically an heuristic, isn't it? Like, basically, when, because we perceive patterns, like when mm -hmm. we know, we know, like, what effects consistently happen, even though we don't know what the cause is. So it's like, yeah, we, if we, if you go to a park and it's like a calm, sunny day and there's like bird song all around you, you just naturally feel relaxed. And it's because like, uh, when, you know, when there's birds and life all around you, it's like, oh, this is an area of abundant food. And then if you go, sometimes people will build parks in the middle of a city and they'll be like super pretty and seem tranquil, but you'll just go there and just something seems off and you can't really relax. And it's because there's like no wildlife has been introduced to that park yet. And so there is no bird song, which our mind interprets as, hey, there's a large predator somewhere around that I can't see yet, but the birds know, and that's why they're all hiding, and then yeah. you just feel anxious. And Well, yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of that stuff is kind of evolutionary, you know, instinctual. Mm -hmm. um, so when we go to these spots, which are, you know, not our ancestors necessarily, but just like ancestral humans have chosen for specific reasons as holy or sacred spots, um, you know, often I guess there might be some, I'm sure kind of that idea of, oh, I'm in a holy spot might have a part to play in kind of giving you that feeling, especially if there's like a fucking pyramid there, like, you know, right. hard to not feel epic. I mean, I imagine it's hard to not feel epic when you're just like standing at a pyramid, but you know, maybe I mean, again, more... it's, it's like 10 feet tall and 10 feet wide. It's not like Okay. The well, most impressive. It's not like Teotihuacan or anything, but yeah. it is. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe that even... In any case, uh, it's interesting it's, to think about. It still is impressive. I mean, it's one of those things where it's like, someone could go there and be like, oh, this feels sacred, we should commemorate it, but then when it takes probably a whole village effort over the course of years to actually haul all the stones up there and build that staircase literally up a mountain and then build the pyramid up the mountain, people were really committed to that idea. It wasn't yeah. just like... Oh, that's yeah. pretty cool. I mean, if it's, even if it's only 10 feet by 10 feet, like, I don't know. I That would take a long time to haul stones up a mountain yeah. to build something like that. For sure. Um, yeah, so that was just really cool. And then the uh, the Hacienda in particular that we saw in Tapasla and the reason we were there, I think it was my favorite and the one I would choose because I found it, like, the prettiest. Um but it's probably not going to be chosen just because it is the least convenient. Like, a lot of the guests that would be coming live in Cuernavaca, which was the other town. Mm -hmm. So it just makes more sense to choose one of the ones in Cuernavaca. And my girlfriend was even telling her parents, like, why are we even, like, looking at this one here? Like, we know we're not going to have it in Tepustlan. But yeah. in any case, it's one of those things, kind of speaking of aesthetic and the irrational feelings you get from places, it's like some of my favorite kinds of places have you ever been in a place that it's like it's simultaneously the most beautiful place you've ever been but also like really creepy just because it's like kind of uh you know like like lonely beauty i guess yeah yeah uh, yeah so it's one of the i mean part of it we got there as like the sun was beginning to set so it's like a little ways from the town it's surrounded by nature there's like these beautiful flowers like flower bushes and flowering trees all over the place and like a river going through it so it's super beautiful and serene but also like well and just that it's an ex hacienda which is still beautiful but like beautiful in kind of a crumbling old rustic way mm -hmm. so it's like this is really pretty but also probably haunted uh <laughs> i don't know if you've ever seen any del toro movies guillermo mm -hmm. del toro like Labyrinth Dodo Fauno or Crimson Peak? No, no, I haven't. And well, I feel like a lot of people in... tell me that's something I need to remedy, and I will eventually, but... Yeah. yeah. It's, uh, it's an aesthetic that he captures really well, probably because he's Mexican, and these places are all around in Mexico. Yeah. Uh, just of, like, the beautiful horror, I guess, is the way of saying it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And 
So, you know, it's just an irrational thing. I can't explain why that sort of place resonates with me, but it does. And then it also got me thinking, um, just because I am a horror fan and I love horror movies and, like, I'm part of the problem when it comes to horror. Basically, the reason so many horror movies are terrible is that horror fans are so desperate to see horror movies that they'll keep seeing all the terrible ones and keep giving money to the people who make them. So there's not really an incentive to make good horror movies. Mm. But in any case, I've seen like you know all the horror tropes because i've seen so many of the movies and then it struck me that like it seems like a perfect setting and plot for a horror movie that i don't think i've ever seen done would be a wedding like there are definitely stories where the origin is like oh a bride died on her way to her wedding and now she haunts this place but have you ever seen or heard of a horror story where it actually takes place like at a wedding i don't know i mean i don't watch horror really so well, i guess I, I don't know i haven't heard of one offhand just my you know yeah, I just, I mean, Maybe. all the, like, psychological stress of planning and executing a wedding to begin with just makes it, like, a super tense situation. Mm -hmm. And then the thing that, like, you know, most times in a larger wedding, like, the... You know what? Uh, the room will have a lot of the guests, and it's like, huh? Uh, you just lagged for the last... Uh, oh. a few seconds, so everything kind of came out all at once. Uh, I was going to say, what would be really funny for the plot of a horror movie is, like, <clears throat> it would be them planning the wedding, but then, like, everything that could possibly go wrong with a wedding that would, you know, might normally go wrong, goes wrong, but in, like, a horror way, like, the, you know, they'd be stressing out about the flowers, but then they get the flowers, and the flowers would be wrong, but because they're actually monster flowers that try to eat the guests or whatever, or, I don't know, just things like that. It, maybe maybe this would be better as kind of like a tongue-in-cheek like A horror comedy? Movie. Yeah. Horror comedy is a really big genre, arguably even b bigger than horror itself. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the main thing that I was thinking, like I was saying, so the bride has their guests and the groom has their guests and there's some overlap and they know some of each other's friends, but usually not all of them. And then uh, people bring plus ones. So there could definitely be one or more guests. And, I mean, this is a trope that's used a lot in comedy and like wedding crashers and stuff uh but there could definitely be guests who show up to a wedding and no one would have no idea that nobody knows who they are mm -hmm. uh yeah so you could totally have zombies or ghosts or whatever just at the wedding the whole time and yeah okay. but anyway that was just a random thought i had while i was there i think that about wraps up my travel story all right. So, unless you have anything further to say, we can move into our news. I don't think so. Yeah, we've got Current events. some... Uh, this one should definitely be an interesting topic of conversation. For sure. And you're going to be taking the lead on this one because I know what it is and know of the imp some of the implications, but I don't, I don't really know science. So, would you like to tell us about CRISPR? Um, Why it's in the yeah, news? Yeah, so, I guess... Just to start out, like, I I know a bunch about science, but for me, and a lot about just, you know, human science, but for me it's more, I, you know, I'm more into the, the neuroscience and the pharmacology and just more, you know, I, I have not jumped into DNA and learning about that entire world, just because, you know, the science of genetics is its own kind of thing where not even, you know, not even necessarily the the mechanics of how genetics works but just the way like the genes if you kind of put an abstraction layer on the genes and just you know labeled them and uh, you know just kind of the way they how, how, what am i even trying to say the, the genetics is so complicated that there are there are multiple different like sub fields um that you can kind of take right. like you know actually how the genetics plays out in sort of um you know not even with the, the mechanics or you know just how the synthesis of multiple sets of genes coming together and producing a new set of genes like that's its whole field the actual science of how the genes uh, you know how they are put together on a molecular level um you know all that stuff it, it's just so complicated um that I really haven't, I have not scratched the surface of it. But I do know enough to kind of tell you what CRISPR is. So CRISPR is this technology. Um, All right. Uh, we actually what? have a 30 second break. 30 second? Yeah.
Sure. Okay. Okay. Right. Yes, we are taking Both a 30 second break. Because I kind of need to run to the bathroom and you were kind of roboting out, so it will give the internet a chance okay. to. Yeah, you've been kind of doing that yeah. off and on recently. Sorry. But I just refresh my internet connection, so maybe it will be better in any way. case. All right. Be back in like 30 seconds. Sounds good. I'm back. Okay. Sorry about that. Welcome back. Oh, it's okay. All right. So starting from the top. Um, so obviously CRISPR, uh, spelled C-R-I-S-P-R, -R, um, has been in the news a lot recently. Um, I mean, at least I've been seeing it a lot because I kind of pay attention to scientific news, but I feel like it probably has been in the news a lot just because it's got some massive implications. Um, so basically... It is, it's a technology we are using to edit genes. And so how this basically works is um, CRISPR was actually um, just a sequences of genetics in bacteria and archaea, or archaea, archaea. Uh, it's just a whole other f f uh, kingdom of just life. You know, it's similar to bacteria and that is, you know, microscopic organisms. Um, so what they are is they're basically defense mechanisms against viruses. So you know how viruses will come in and inject their own DNA into a host cell and use that to reproduce. Um, CRISPR is basically a defense mechanism that will look over, um, you know, the bacteria's DNA and if it finds a specific set of DNA, it'll modify it back to what it's supposed to be. It's basically a defense mechanism against viruses. Um, so the really cool thing about it is since it, you know, it already is a technology that looks, finds a specific set of genes, and then turns those genes into something else. So you can kind of see how that's very few steps away. Like, it's basically this ready-made technology. We just change around a couple things and just say, we want to edit this DNA to this. So obviously, actually using the thing is, you know, I guess at this point, it's usable. Um, there are a bunch of contingencies for how it can be used, but they're figuring that all out. And, you know, it hasn't been very, I mean, I think it's only been really 10 years, maybe 12 years that people have been kind of messing around with this stuff. And already we're getting to, you know, getting to the main point of this story that's been in the news the last week. Um, they're doing some pretty amazing stuff with it. Um, so... Did we bring back dinosaurs? Not yet. Um, so oh, basically, yeah, yeah. Uh, if we can just say, replace this DNA with a different set of DNA, and if we could unleash this upon, um, you know, human DNA, 
is so many diseases these days are genetic and obviously there are problems that we have to work around like we actually have to figure out which specific genes are the ones that cause it because we have you know billions of you know, our, our DNA is just huge um, so we have to you know figure out the specific genes that are causing the problems and we need to change them without changing anything else that'll cause problems blah 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 but we are finally to the point where we have tweaked DNA uh, in viable human embryos and I guess this happened on August 20th or some you know somewhere um, very close to that so human you know, obviously these aren't humans that are going to um, I, I don't believe these are yeah they're not humans that are going to grow up this is more of just like a proof of principle uh, you know kind of a first go saying look this can be done and right. so they were trying to take Marfan syndrome uh, or just you know take and they have corrected a single amino acid sequence that just as a result in Marfan syndrome. Um, and so the interest, you know, where all the kind of implicate, yeah? Maybe this is a stupid question, but since they were viable human embryos, so it's just like, it was a decision, like, I guess for ethical reasons that like, we're not actually going to like, allow these embryos to grow up into people but like they could have yeah so i mean technically you know i think they are you know they're not inside a human um these are embryos at a very early stage um so yeah i mean they they aren't going to go anywhere but yeah they i mean theoretically if they were put inside a woman i guess they could be brought to term um you know Obviously, this is the very first go. They probably don't want to do that just because I, I, I know. I mean, there are all sorts of things that could possibly go wrong. But the interesting thing is, they, you know, apparently there weren't any. They were not. There weren't any off-target effects, um, and so it seems like it worked perfectly fine. Like all the DNA in this embryo was changed around, so the the specific um you know amino acid sequence in the genetics was changed to a state that is, you know is normal and would not result in the infant having marfan syndrome um right so, so yeah i guess basically the thing so the big news i guess uh if i'm understanding correctly so obviously we haven't done it and have chosen not to do it but basically we successfully edited an embryo that could have become a person so we basically do yes. have the power now to edit the genes of a person who then goes on to be a person yeah so and it, it's still very simple crazy. like they only had to correct one amino acid i guess that's why they chose to deal with mm -hmm. marfan syndrome because it um apparently is only you know there's only one section of the genetics that actually affects that um but i mean if that worked perfectly well then they can start going for more complex things yeah i mean so what becomes very interesting to me is a lot of people would argue, you know, this is beyond, you know, this isn't a sperm and an egg. This is the synthesis of a sperm and an egg into something that is actually growing into a human. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, like people have abortions way later than this current stage. Um, and But that's obvious, you know, that's a very controversial issue. So at this point, a lot of people would say, yeah, we have basically played God at this point. Like this, yeah, in my works. opinion, this basically is like, like, obviously I'm, you know, very, I'm very pro-choice um, when it comes to abortion. But I still, you know, at this point, I guess it becomes complicated because, you know, my definition of living thing probably is a lot broader than a lot of people's is. Um, but, you know, at this point, this is a, this is a thing that, Ha, it has negative entropy, you know, it is extropy. It's basically, if there's anything by which we can define life as, it's, you know, something that defies the laws of entropy and creates a more ordered system with a greater, um, you know, density of energy. And that's what this embryo right. is doing. Um, so, yeah, it, a lot of people, I'm sure there are plenty of people who are just horrified right now because we have decided, you know, we have taken embryo that would grow up to be one thing and made it so it's going to be something completely different in this case yeah. definitely for and the better but now you start to get like you know yeah I, I was gonna let's say so i don't i mean obviously i'm interested in and have a very basic understanding of the science of it but i'm not an expert by any means but 
I guess I do have a lot more to say on the ethics of it, which is it's, I don't know, you know you're in for something when basically the uh, abortion versus no abortion, like the pro-choice versus pro-life part of this is like scratching the surface of, obviously there are going to be a lot of people who say in embryo at any stage, just for full disclosure, I am pro-choice too. But so the pro-life people would say, an embryo at any stage is alive and like doing this research and then aborting the embryo to begin with is just completely immoral. So you have mm -hmm. that stage, but then even once you get that, there could be a lot of, there could, like, could be tons of pro-life or sorry, pro-choice people who are still completely horrified by the thought, like all the implications of CRISPR. So it's yeah. very, very messy and complicated ethically. For sure. And there's all sorts of, you know, what's going to become very interesting is the first thing, for some reason, my mind immediately goes to like sports. I don't know why. Just because mm -hmm. obviously with the performance enhancing drugs, that's already very, um, mm -hmm. you know, that is taking the normal biological course of a body and a system and altering it. Um, and this is something right. where we could... Designers, baby. Designer babies. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where we go. We could, you know, at some point in the future, if we, uh, I don't know, just hypothetically say there's some disease which causes a, you know, much significantly lower testosterone in a, um, a human, and it's correctable in a very simple way by just, like, changing somebody's base testosterone levels and jacking them up, I, I don't know if you know if this would end up being a thing, but then just you know just to save that person's life. So now that this person, right. I mean, has a, a baseline higher level of testosterone than other normal people. Um, I mean, first that wouldn't really necessarily be detectable by any sort of test. Like you'd actually have to get medical records and go back and look. But you know, and that is, is that actually wrong? Is just because this person had you know some genetic illness? I mean. You know, there's all sorts of weird implications, and we start getting to the thing. It's going to be really hard to kind of keep track of everybody's, um, you know, genetic mutations or, you know, not mutations, but changes if we kind of go down this route. I mean, yeah, then getting to the whole designer baby, like, obviously, I, I feel like we're going to get to a point where if this is an easily, if this process is easily carried out, I bet everybody, you know, every child is just going to be streamed screened for genetic disorders and i think that's a really good thing just because for sure you know it's kind of when if you know a child is going to have a, you know some sort of genetic disorder that puts them in you know just makes their life miserable and short and they're going you know they're going to die after 20 years and that entire 20 years your whole healthcare system is going to have to be just constantly supporting them, you know, millions of dollars are going to be poured into their lives, like throughout, you know, their very short life, and their quality of life is just going to be horrible. Um, you know, like why, obviously, we want to fix that, or, you know, I, I would even argue if it's caught early on enough, I, you know, I know this might be a very controversial statement, but I, you know, I'm very of the opinion that you know, abortion is not only, you know, an option, but should be really what people are looking at just because it's kind of unfair to put, you know, birth a human into that kind of situation. But, you know, we're I, going to... I, I can see the logic. I don't know if I would go that far. Like, yeah, I guess I wouldn't. Like, I could go both ways on, like, whether you should abort a baby that's going to have illnesses like that. Uh, but I would definitely say like that, you know, if we had, if everyone had CRISPR technology and you could edit out the genes that are going to cause all that suffering to your child, I definitely think there would be an imperative, moral imperative there to like, uh -huh. yes, you should edit out those diseases. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, the other things, like think of the anti-vax crowd, for example, right yeah. now, like, you know, they are super, they're just against science, basically. Um, I don't know what their problem with science is, but people who have that kind of mentality, who, you know, they know that their kid is going to be born, you know, autistic, or I guess with Marfan syndrome, and they are just like, no, we're not going to do any science, you know, it's just going to be as God intended them to be, um, you know, I mean, 
then we start getting into a moral area where, like, is that their right to do that? Um, you know, because... It's actually a super interesting one, just... Uh... Like, I have no idea. Like you said, uh, a lot of those people, they tend to just kind of distrust science and scientific uh, consensus in general, and I could definitely see them distrusting something like CRISPR. But isn't... This is at least a stereotype. I don't know how many people think this, but the argument I always heard is, like, they think that vaccines cause autism, and that's why they don't want to vaccinate their kids, because they think it will give their kids autism. So if that's their whole... If they're like, I'm willing to expose my kids to possible death by disease because autism is worse then maybe they would be okay with it maybe i mean it's it's really hard to say or you know i'm sure a lot of people are going to look at this and go oh we don't know how to edit a genome so you know everybody's so different that it's impossible to edit a genome like they're it'll just cause more problems yeah i there's inevitably going to be people who are off their rocker um you know no matter if they're the exact same anti-vax travel like i'd bet that there would be an overlap Maybe not a complete overlap. I, you know, I'm sure there are people who are anti-vaxxers who are, you know, they want to be doing the right thing. They're just, you know, misguided or ignorant. Um, but then, you know, there are some who just have such a distrust of science that no matter mm. what comes out of it, um, you know, they're probably... Yeah, I mean, I... Or yeah. people who are, you know, think big medicine or, you know, big pharma are all out to get them, you know, are going to view this as just another thing that... The medical establishment is pushing. You know, you know it, it's really hard to say what we're going to see, and that's not even, you know, just to say the people who are going to have religious arguments against this. And I, I think that might actually be the biggest opposition we're seeing to this whole thing. Religious um, or just philosophical in general? Like I, yeah, I know people who I guess would you would say they're atheists, but they're still like you know, we shouldn't be messing around with nature or playing God, or even if they don't believe in a God, they don't think yeah. we should be God either. I mean, it, it does feel weird. Like, uh, I don't know if you kind of have this feeling, but it is, you know, the idea of designer babies, just, it feels weird. The idea that we could go and just pick out the characteristics, mm-hmm. because I mean, obviously that's not going to be the first wave of this. It might even take like 50 years to we get to that point. Who knows what kind of legislation we'll see. Maybe this will, it'll be something mm-hmm. that's only allowed in specific cases. And um, it's probably just but, like, like, it could definitely just be a cultural thing, because I agree, like, there's not really a logical reason Feel would feel weird. Like, if I was going to have kids and this technology was available, I'd definitely screen for any, like, yeah. debilitating diseases or, like, I mean, uh, one thing, one reason why I'm not sure I would want to have kids is I have conditions that are very highly heritable uh i think like adhd has like a 75 percent chance of being I don't well know the okay numbers, but adhd like... is a little bit different because it is okay. actually more a nurture thing um so i mean it is heritable okay. in that way but that's kind of like right in um... any case uh i would definitely like screen them for conditions that i wouldn't want them to have but also i don't think i would do a design because I, I kind of want my kid to just be a random thing and then see how they come out and like yeah. see let them tell me who they are but but then you like, get... I, I wouldn't be surprised if a couple hundred years in the future people are looking back at us and it's like almost the way we look back at slavery or something like how did how did anyone with the choice to choose how their baby turned out ever think it was a good idea to just leave it to chance like yeah well i mean kind of like what if 20 years down the line you know every all these designer babies have are the people mm-hmm. who are, actually can get the good jobs and stuff because they have the intellectual capacity and then your kids just pissed off at you because you know you didn't make them yeah. smart or whatever like yeah we're just gonna see all sorts of crazy weird things like that and i mean when you really think about it too I mean, this is basically natural selection, kind of just, you know, we are, it's another method, it's another way where we are taking the selection kind of into our own hands. And, you know, it That's isn't true. even taking actually... it into the own hands. It is just the, it is the next progression in natural selection. I guess there isn't even really a delimiter there. Like, we've kind of been doing that more and more first with sort of social selection and then kind of, you know, just, I mean, it's that good. is, I think that is the argument actually that would convince me to use it is that so we were talking about nature earlier and how at least uh the perspective i have around this that you know nature is basically all about evolution and humans have stopped evolving like in the normal way we're still evolving culturally and like our ideas are evolving exponentially but also like uh 
you know, we talked about this before with why mental illness is becoming more widespread is that people with really bad mental illness used to just die because they couldn't survive. And now we can keep them alive, which obviously is a good thing for humanity, but also means that, you know, we're not evolving. We're, as a species, we're getting more of these inheritable diseases or whatever. There's no reason, like, a strong baby and a weak baby have the same chance to survive in today's society, so there's no impulse for us to evolve to be stronger. So it's like, obviously, I don't want to say, like, okay, let's go back to the brutality of nature and everyone kill each other and whoever survives gets to pass on their genes. Like, no, I don't think society would be better that way, but also you know, if we want evolution to continue, then we might have to force it with something like CRISPR. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's kind of, I, doing this is kind of going to become necessary because we kind of did hit a little bit, you know, last 100, 150 years, we hit a rough patch in evolution where suddenly everybody kind of just lives, basically. Yeah. Um, evolution has taken a, a, a quick 180 in the other direction. Our gene pool is getting very, very muddied. And this might just be necessary to kind of, you know, if not go forward, at least kind of maintain without things getting just out of control. But I mean, kind of the nature versus the whole playing God or just nature thing, like there is at no point did we stop becoming nature. Like we're not something that's different than nature. Mm-hmm. We are, we are nature. We are just nature For sure. yeah. progressing. And you know, we might not like the way it goes, but you know, we nature isn't going towards some ultimate goal. Like his ultimate goal wasn't to evolve intelligent, evolve intelligent. Intelligence just happened to work. And you might even argue intelligence doesn't, you know, nature the entire goal of evolution if there there isn't a goal but you know what evolution does basically is just self-replicate the things that can Mm -hmm. self-replicate the most have one evolution at this point that's not even humans that's like fruit flies or bacteria basically like we actually don't do a great job of you know we think we're the highest form of life and you know we are in some ways like we have intelligence maybe i'm pretty sure that's cockroaches yeah um so it's like, yeah, we have this kind of misguided ideal that intelligence was this thing that, you know, evolution and nature was always kind of going towards. Like, it was inevitable. Sorry, um, I know this is, like, a, the most inane, stupid tangent, but, like, I kind of say that as a joke, and, you know, the joke is always like, oh, if there's a nuclear holocaust, cockroaches will be the only thing to survive. But, like, I think it was a couple months ago now, but there was a story of, like, this Chinese factory that basically it got kind of a cockroach infestation and then i think it was it was like some sort of meat processing factory or basically the resources were so abundant there the cockroaches just like went into a super cycle of evolution and kept like evolving to resist all the pesticides and stuff and the company actually basically just surrendered the factory and said like the cockroaches have won like we cannot yeah. beat the cockroaches we're <laughs> shutting down this factory and building a new one like yeah. it is like yeah cockroaches are possibly the highest the highest of all evolution of life and Maybe. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I think it's silly to kind of say something is going against nature because, no, this is just yeah. nature doing its thing. This is evolution happening. Um, mm. And if we don't like it, that's almost more reason to kind of take control of it before it starts going. You know, because, uh, so this, you know, this is another interesting thing to just think about. Um, you know, we're getting to the point, obviously, there's a technology that drugs, basically. Drugs have been made illegal. But we have got to the point now where, you know, there are hundreds of these little groups of people just in their garages or whatever, whipping up these research chemicals that are, you know, in gray areas. You know, people just making psychedelics or stimulants or opiates that are different enough in structure so they circumvent laws and are no longer, you know, and legislation just can't keep up with them. There's just more and more. That couldn't be done something like 50 years ago. 50 years ago, you need an industrial lab. Um, you know, you need to be Pfizer or, um, you know, uh, Novotis or, you know, one of those companies who just has the, you know, has the resources to bring hundreds of people together to make these chemicals. But now our technology is to the point where, you know, any group of, college kids can just go and do that in the garage or basement the same type of thing is going to happen with CRISPR especially I, I'd almost say just because you know I, again I don't really know the specifics but I do know that anything that starts off big and is eventually 
um, you know, our technology advances far enough, anybody can, you know, with genetic testing, for example, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, when the human genome was first sequenced, it was this billions of, you know, cost billions of billions of dollars to do one. And I guess recently, um, I don't know, recently 100,000 human genomes have been sequenced and it costs like $100 to get your whole, you know, your genetics tested by, at 23andMe or whatever, just in the course of 12 years. So who's to say 15 years from now, people aren't going to just be doing CRISPR like in their garages or basin and a few For can. sure. And th there are so many ways, like I said, the ethics of this are it's like such a mess and there are so many ways we could go with this but one part of the conversation is people uh fact, and i believe this is true i just don't think it will be as long a window as the alarmists think is there is going to be a period of time where this technology is available to the rich and not the poor and so mm -hmm. in addition to all the other advantages they have rich parents will literally just be able to design superior babies to yeah. poor ones and they'll have all the advantages but then probably that will be true for a decade and everyone will hate it and then yeah. it will be available to everyone the, after the that. problem is so. the there are so many more poor people than rich people that the money is you know i, I mean i guess you kind of have a preto principle thing going on yeah. where the rich are going to be able to pay a lot of money to just have every you know super babies but for sure. then it's you're a still criticism going, of like going to have a market yeah I mean, it's a, it's a criticism you hear all the time of, like, how many is, like, SpaceX right now, and people are like, oh, like, I hate Elon Musk and his company. Like, he's just bringing super rich billionaires to space for no reason, and it's so stupid, and what's the point of all this? And it's like, you don't realize that in 10 years, you're going to be able to buy a ticket yeah. to space for, like, $10. Okay, well, maybe I mean, probably the for the thing. price of an airline. But the yeah. thing, yeah, these, the rich people are paying huge like subsidies to you basically exactly yeah making... people get mad at it because they want to be the first ones to do it or they feel excluded or whatever but it's literally like the this is such a scam to the rich people it's like yeah. hey pay a billion dollars for what's going to cost ten dollars in ten years exactly but... yeah they are making it possible for you and yeah. it just makes sense like you know it would be an absolute or elon musk or you know and... blue origin to go okay we're going to you know make space flights for a thousand dollars so you know you and your friends could go to, no they're just gonna go bankrupt immediately like it's not even yeah, a not to mention choice. they're probably getting like the shitty <laughs> version of what the consumer version will be like yeah there is in beta they're ironing out the kinks not like i know everything they're doing is probably at like the highest safety standards but i'm just it's more likely that one of those billionaires is going to die in space yeah. than any of us because the technology is just going to keep improving so for sure it's like they're paying a premium to be guinea pigs, and then mm -hmm. we just have to be a little patient, and we'll pay way less for a better product. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like playing the beta video games, like, you know, yeah. people who are going in and doing the testing and everything for, you know, they're, they're playing the shittier version of the game, so, you know, you or the regular consumer can later on have a good experience, like, I don't know. For sure. Um, yeah. So yeah, I kind of derailed us here, but it's I do think it's totally a valid concern that rich people are going to get this first and it will give them even more of an advantage, but I also think it will very quickly trickle down to everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and uh, again, we kind of it's going to take I guess maybe the first decade of the super kids will maybe grow up, you know, a little bit faster, but I mean, you know, it takes like 20 years for this stuff to actually even materialize. I guess maybe in high school, maybe if they're really super smart learners or what. I don't know. It'll, and I'm sure some of this technology will come out in ways or with regulations that we just can't even imagine right now. Like we don't really know what the landscape's going to be. We can only really just, you know, think about, I uh, don't know. I mean, we can talk and think about the implications. Like it's super interesting for sure. Um, but yeah, there are so many, I I don't even really know what to talk about next. And it's, I, you know, it's kind of hard to even say like how we should tackle some of these things. Cause you know, I have mm -hmm. my thought of the whole thing, like is I, you know, I think this is going to be really, it's a much needed, it just, it's really needed for humanity in general to be able to do this as, you know, mm -hmm. as I've said before, because we are muddling our gene pool, we've kind of, taken natural selection into our own hands but then just messed it up so it doesn't even apply and we do need a fix for that or else for sure oh, yeah or, i guess yeah kind of jumping ahead to 
the end of the conversation and then we'll jump back. But like, yeah, I would say if it had to be a binary choice, I would say I am pro gene editing, yeah. like overall. I do think there would be more good than bad. But that said, like, I won't deny it. Like, there's definitely horrifying potential implications or potential things you could do with this mm -hmm. if it's a lot of things where, like, I don't know what the motivation would be, but, like, you know, we can edit out the diseases. You could also edit horrible diseases into babies, and I have no idea, like, what the motivation would be for anyone yeah. to do that, but, like, I, mean, I won't <clears throat> deny that it's possible. The other... So the other scary thing as well is if looking at it from a biological weapon point of view. Oh uh, yeah, that's um, the part I was gonna. So this is a concern that you've probably even heard raised about things like Twenty Three and Me, and the reason why people are scared to use that service is like you can use it and get your own genetic code, but if someone else gets their hands at that, again, like there's not a huge motivation for people to do this unless you're like the president, and even then there's probably more effective ways to assassinate you. But like if someone has your genetics, they can literally create a designer disease specifically to kill you yeah and although then, we're still you know we're we're not at that level where we can create yeah. designer diseases for things but, or what we're going to be able to do sooner is it's, it's a lot easier to destroy things than to create things right mm -hmm. so more what i was thinking is the easiest way like with biological weapons one of the main appeal of their usage is that not only do you kill people, you can also do huge financial damage to a country. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, so cancer, dealing with cancer is hugely expensive. Um, if you had some sort of, because CRISPR is basically taking genetics, you know, taking a sequence of genes and replacing it with another sequence of genes, like that's all cancer is, just a mutation in the genetics, which, you know, leads yeah. to um, the cells, death, you know, the apoptosis mechanics not working correctly. And if you just had some airborne pathogen, which, you know, is basically a virus, which just edited genetics to just cause cancer, you could, I mean, even if you just put like a million people in hospitals with cancer, our no system would be able to keep up with that. Like, and, but sure. we would try, like there would be an ethical responsibility mm -hmm. to try to treat all those people and it could cause, you know, just economic devastation. Um, so that's a little sure. bit scary. Just yeah. I I guess how would like would it be that like one country would have spies working in the hospital of another country or how would you act how would you edit all those genes in the first place? Well, because CRISPR you know, when you're using CRISPR as I understand it, like it's just an a bacteria's defense mechanism basically. So, you know, it's I think they basically, it's basically kind of like putting a virus in somebody and having that virus, except it's not a virus. It's more just the cellular mechanism. So, so I it's mean, something it, you could if, like make airborne and infect pregnant women or like no, I was thinking even, of it, you have to take oh, the no. embryo out and put it in a test. No, tube. no, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be an embryo. That's the thing. You can oh. use it on, you know, you can use it on existing cells. And that that's the idea oh. behind it. Like it, since it's a bacteria's defense mechanism, um, you know, it's happening in an actual living bacteria in a living cell. And oh, I don't so, even know. So it's not even designer babies. Like we would be able to design ourselves and like change. Yeah, potentially. Message. And I think the thing is, since the reason they're focusing on embryos right now is because, you know, an embryo is a small collection of cells. You don't have to edit, edit the genes of every single, because every single cell contains your entire genetic code or at least, no, most cells contain your entire genetic code. Um, there are a bunch of cells in the body, like blood, some types of blood cells, which don't have DNA in them. Um, but I mean, trillions upon trillions, like quadrillions of cells in your body that all have to be edited. Whereas with an embryo, it's significantly less and they're all you know just clumped together. So that's kind of why they're doing embryos first. But theoretically, I mean, I think just the delivery mechanism would be, you know, that's kind of, probably where some of the issues would be. But, I mean, just looking at the advances in technology with all the technology we've ever had, you know, 10 years from now, who knows what we'll have. We might be able to, you know, it might be an sure. alternative to stem cells where, you know, just edit every, you know, the entire, your entire body's genetic. So you deal with, you know, some sort of genetic disease. Um, but, you know, it could even be just an airborne, thing potentially right. that infects a person you know you don't even have to edit their entire body yeah. to be cancerous you could you know just ed edit a significant portion of a you know a certain amount of cells then then you have a tumor that starts growing and goes yeah. out of control I, so 
So, I mean, obviously horrible, horrifying implications and how it could be weaponized, but then also I, like, like I said, I can kind of see both sides. I'm of two minds when it comes to possibly editing the genes of my future children, but I'm totally on board with editing my own genes. I'm crazy with yeah. that. And so that's exciting. Also, so but yeah, you go... I get... you... Oh, I was just going to say, I guess, you know, thinking about it, the the interesting thing is maybe a possibly as a weapon, I guess it could be its own antidote, though, too, because, mm-hmm. you know, you just, I mean, you have to figure out what gene specifically got edited. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah. So there's a whole host of... people have the technology. Yeah, then it just becomes like nuclear weapons where if two countries race. have it, they're not going to attack yeah. each other. So. And so, but, you know, it's also the kind of thing where if some pe- person in their basement could be using this stuff... Um, it might yeah. be a lot less obvious than, you know, dealing with nuclear weapons. So oh, definitely, it's, yeah. Um, I don't know. There's a whole host of, like, very alarming implications. There's a whole for host sure. of, so, like, not so alarming uh, implications. Like, you go to weaponizing it and using it against another country, the place my mind goes to, and you have to tell me if this is even realistic, but, and it's not something I think would happen, but something that I guess theoretically could happen is we get one of those dystopian societies that's in all the young adult novels where there's some super corrupt government that takes over everything and then assuming that government has a monopoly on CRISPR technology other than obviously you can just like have designer babies for the ruling class and then the poor don't get that but then also could you theoretically you could just make sure that it's like required on birth that everyone who's not a part of the ruling class gets a gene edited one way and everyone who is part of it gets it a different way and it's just like vulnerability to a disease so then you could create a pathogen that's completely harmless to the ruling class and would just annihilate the working class and then that could basically be the way they keep the population in check is like hey if there's an uprising we'll release this disease that we're immune to and would kill you yeah i mean i think there's a whole bunch of things you could do with it like probably some of the things you could do with it that might be horrible are things that are very sneaky that we you know could not even think about i mean you know something they could do is just like they can make i mean it'll be really interesting if we start editing our genetics and our genetics start diverging very slowly apart like i wonder if you yeah. might get to the point where we might have incompatibilities between different people or it's maybe we could even you know edit it so the lower you know the not people who aren't of the ruling class basically literally can't breed with people who are of the ruling class like i know maybe their genetics would divide or they'd specifically make it like that so you know they're not interbreeding or whatever so you but, got me thinking of different species but like oh go ahead well i mean it could just get to the point where having a baby you don't do it the old-fashioned way anymore you just go and you know you have an embryo there ready to go and you're just editing everything from the ground up you might put some of your dna in just for the character you know basic characteristics like looks and everything um but realistically it'd probably be easier to not even take you know a sperm and egg or anything out of the people and just you know yeah. go and they have a bank of things and you punch in what you're baby is going to be like you know just prick your finger so they get some of your dna and you know synthesize it that way um for sure yeah i thought look we've been thinking of all the uh practical uses like oh people are going to want their kids or themselves to be stronger or smarter or whatever but i just realized what's definitely going to happen in our future just given how big cosplay is and the way that i know geeks and nerds are is there's going to be so many people who just want to edit their genes to like become elves and like nah. the doctors will be like you know there's actually no advantage to these long pointy ears you won't actually like your hearing will be worse and they'll be like i don't care i want to be an elf and yeah. that's just gonna oh yeah i mean it will genetic be, like... cosplay is gonna be a huge thing and i mean at some point actual surgery for you know cosmetic things like plastic uh, yeah surgery it'll just you know, be inferior to basically just having your genetics change or using stem cell therapy. Which, so the stuff just regrows back better or without. For you know. sure. Yeah. I'm, I guess I'm not, even though there's no real moral or practical opposition to it, it's just a thing that makes me feel a little weird. I'm not really sure how I feel about editing yourself to turn yourself into an elf or something. But yeah. if you are going to do it, I definitely think gene editing is a much more healthy way than Probably plastic sacred. surgery well yeah especially body. since your body is going to just i don't know it's just going to it's going to work better with your body it's going to yeah. be integrated better less chance of things being rejected um i mean you even kind of start to think like what about 
like you know gender reassignment surgery mm -hmm. like stuff like that will be able to be a lot more thorough um, sure. you know, straight off that or it could even be possible that that problem is just eliminated because we're you know specifically making babies to be a specific gender yeah. from the ground up and all the you know the networking in the brain that goes along with that you know transgenderism might just go away because gender dysphoria might just go away because we'd be you know that might be something people are just looking for and just getting rid of um, right and you know so I just all these different things uh, we could literally go on and on about every possible implication yeah. both positive or negative um, but I don't really have too much to say. Obviously, I don't have the answers to any of these things. It's just interesting to think about. Um, yeah. Do you have is. any other final thoughts? Uh, I mean, again, it is just crazy how this is, like, you know, has been a sci-fi idea for a long time, but just, like, colonizing Mars is a thing that we could see the beginning of in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. I mean, again, when I say I'm pro it, obviously there are a lot of concerns and a lot of be abused but i guess uh i was kind of, i've kind of been thinking about this recently when it comes to facebook ads and we talked about this a little how like part of my job now is working with facebook ads which is a thing that you know big data and advertising is definitely abused and has a lot of bad uses but uh i guess i kind of have a deterministic view of like any knowledge that can be learned will be learned and like any yeah discover your innovation that can be made it will happen so we could like say oh like big data just shouldn't be a thing we should ban big data and make all the companies throw away all their data and still like as long as there's an incentive and an advantage to having that like it's maybe it's happen. in other countries that aren't as regulated or they do it on private islands or in secret like that's a, like people are still going to be wanting to use big data because it has all these benefits so i guess my just my overall philosophy is like, instead of trying to say we should clamp down and stop any technology that might have downsides from existing, I mean, that's just not something we can do. Mm -hmm. So with Facebook ads, for example, uh, I'm glad that I'm getting the chance to get a deeper understanding of how it works, because if we're just if we accept that it's just going to be a thing that we're going to have to deal with and i think it is much more productive to be intimately familiar with it and its uses and yeah yeah i, I definitely think yeah from a legislative point of view it makes m way more sense to kind of jump on it to begin with and not be trying to ban it and then eventually inevitably unbanning it because you know other countries are doing it or what you know it's yeah. kind of like same thing with like drug legislation and marijuana legislation like you know it's just now that it was i mean maybe it hasn't been obviously inevitable for a long time but it's been kind of that thing where it was kind of just like a losing battle from the start and it, now people are or, just i mean hurting uh, i mean yeah there's a whole bunch of other things that kind of yeah i mean this is the thing that. again we probably need to do an episode on this sometime but blockchain when people in government talk about like oh i think we should regulate or ban Bitcoin and just uh, good luck with that. It's literally part of yeah. the design of blockchain is it can't really be regulated. Yeah, or when the, you know, I think the SEC was gonna like, and I think they finally did like make an official thing on their exchange or whatever. But a couple of years ago, they were like, nah, it doesn't meet the, these criteria for different stuff. And everybody was like, you know, you do you realize that that's just gonna make it even more unregulated, more, you know, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, I think getting on top of things that are obviously just going to blossom into a thing that's part, like it is going to be part of society and part of culture, and yeah. it makes a lot more sense to just get on top of it so you can actually regulate it and kind of maybe control the narrative of how it unfolds and becomes part of society and let exactly. instead of you know that's the key and definitely something we need to be open-minded about and adapt to um that's what we should strive for but also if you just uh instinctively feel terrified by this whole discussion that's totally okay because part of me feels that way too and mm -hmm. it's perfectly natural to feel terrified by this kind of stuff because it could literally change everything we know about everything but yeah. overcome your baser instincts and yeah I guess try to grapple with it rationally. Yeah.
Cool. All right. So yeah, that's our current events for the day.